Welcome to the Uptick Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Lambert, and get ready for another episode featuring great CEOs, public company leaders, marketing mavens, and entrepreneurs. That's what's up. Hello, I'm joined today on the Uptick Podcast by my friend and part-time supercar driver, Daryl Adams, uh, president and CEO of Shift Group. That's uh, S-H-Y-F-T, or ticker S-H-Y-F on the NASDAQ. Uh, more on the driving later, we'll talk about that, but uh, Daryl's someone I've been impressed with for years since he joined Shift, which at the time was called Spartan Motors. We'll talk about the name change and also how Shift has evolved under Daryl's leadership through growth, a true retooling of the business model, and leaning into the next generation of vehicles and first and last mile delivery. Uh, so it's much growth, and in, in fact, the uh, in, uh, shift is named to the top 100 uh, fastest growing companies by Fortune. That's a, a new list this fall, 2021, uh, and great growth. Really excited to have Daryl on with me today. Daryl, thanks for joining me. Yes, <clears throat> good afternoon, Jeff. Thanks for the opportunity. To, to share a little bit about the shift group with you and, and all your viewers today. Yeah, so tell me, uh, tell, tell the group, uh, our listeners, our viewers, uh, what's, the, what's the elevator pitch on, uh, on, on shift? What are you guys up to? You know, it's, it's funny that elevator pitch has changed a number of times um, over the years, but <clears throat> currently, you know, we are a, uh, especially vehicle manufacturer focused on, on two high growth business segments. The first one would be last mile delivery and the second would be infrastructure. Now, as you mentioned, it used to be Spartan Motors. That has changed, as I, I talked about the elevator pitch, due to the divesture of our ER division. So after that, we are really focused on those two segments. Um, and then the, the last mile delivery segment, we, we manufacture and upfit vehicles for last mile delivery companies, in addition to grocery, laundry and linen, food and beverage, um, and some other industries that, that need that size vehicle. Um, and then the, the vision focused on infrastructure. We, you know, we put that together over the last couple of years uh, through some acquisitions uh, and expanding our national footprint to where today um, all of our, our company stores or, or factory plants uh, can reach 85% of the U.S. population within 300 miles of any of our facilities. So. You know, that's the strategy we put together back in, in late 2017, early 18, and we've been, been working toward that. And uh, we're pretty excited to, to be able to reach that many people with our vehicles. Um, and now we just have to continue to work on the, the strategy for the sales side. Um, production is pretty much there, but as we continue to grow, as you mentioned, you know, the 100 fastest growing companies by Fortune, uh, we need to continue to expand our footprint on a regular basis. So it certainly aptly named uh, Shift Group and really a shift from that emergency rescue heritage business right. to delivery and service. And, you know, some both recent, it's been a great year for you. Uh, but do, do you kind of see, you know, two or three years ago when you were making this, this shift, to use the pun, uh, that, you know, the delivery industry was really coming to that front door? Yeah, we did. We, you know, as a as leader of the Shift Group, um, I'm responsible to make sure that I understand what's going on in our markets, along with our division presidents. And, and I think, you know, over time, you can see more stories and more stories about the, the brick and mortar stores closing. And, and we were in the delivery space with FedEx and, and UPS, <clears throat> United States Postal Service, DHL, Pure Later. And, and then we saw Amazon start to, to get into that space. <clears throat> so, um, that was a, a, a big focus for us in 17, um, working with Amazon and, and giving them a number of vehicles to try out. Um, and then, you know, we saw the growth coming. And then obviously when COVID hit in uh, uh, early 2020, that was, it just escalated the need for delivery vehicles. A lot of stores are closing, people moved to online. So, you know, as I say, I'd rather be lucky than good, but maybe good sometimes. Um, we were in a great spot. We did position the company that way. That was part of our strategy. Um, and, you know, we also sold that ER division right before COVID came on board in February of 20. So um, it was it was really good timing um, uh, for the company and obviously for our shareholders. 
Oh, that's that's awesome, and and you, really, you've you've had uh, both wins through you know certainly before COVID, through COVID, and then even recently, a nice uh, fifty plus million dollar U.S. Postal Service. Again, maybe a stodgy brand, uh, but continues to be one of the leaders, and you're helping them uh, move into the future. Talk to me about that, you know, that relationship. Yeah, that, you know, I think it's it's not just with the USPS; it's with any customer. Um, you know, it's it's our team and something I put in place when I when I joined um, the shift group is we have to be customer focused and we have to build high quality durable vehicles uh, that's that's just basics right but then when you look beyond that I also tell the team we have to be agile nimble flexible proactive and solution based in everything we do and I think when you when you look at the USPS contract that's the the carry-on order but we announced the first order back in 17 at our analyst day, and that gave us our launch to the East Coast strategy um, and, and helped us fill out our, our national footprint. And yeah, it might be a, a, a older brand, but um, you know, when we, we look at it, we don't see the USPS going away. Uh, they continue to buy vehicles. Uh, we're still um, doing a number of the uh, Mercedes Metris vehicles down in our South Carolina plant on a regular basis um, while they try to figure out what the next gen delivery vehicle will be. But um, we, we like them as a customer and we're excited to continue to build this order out in Pennsylvania. Yeah, I think they really, you know, managed to compete really nicely and, and maybe kind of woke up and responded to all the, the competition. It's, it's fun to see the back and forth and, and see those vehicles showing up at my house way too much, which I blame my wife for that. But I think we all have that problem, actually. I'm not, uh, not sure you're unique. Yeah, yeah. Well, and so speaking of, of at home delivery, uh, the, your Velocity product and, and uh, the small format, uh, also moving into grocery delivery vehicles, you know, is, is, is that another piece of the, of the stool here? <clears throat> yeah, I think it's, when we look at it, um, you know, grocery, uh, the grocery industry is is really really thin margins. Um, I belong to a couple associations, and, and we continue to talk about it with the leaders of the grocery companies. Um, and and I think, you know, like last mile delivery um, figured it out. Grocery is I believe, believe they're early in their transition to home delivery. Um, it's more difficult if you ask me. <clears throat> Someone needs to really be home. Um, or there needs to be, you know, a refrigerator on the, and a freezer on the front porch, which people probably wouldn't like that too much. But um, there needs to be some more development into how can they deliver the groceries into your home or into your garage where they can do it throughout the day instead of only when people are home because that's a small window. <clears throat> so, again, I, like, like EVs and, and other technologies, it will come. It's just going to take, you know, some time. But you know, we have a great team here at the Shift Group, and and we're constantly in touch with with all the customers, uh, making sure that we understand their needs. And and again, as long as we're agile, nimble, flexible, right, we we can stay with them um, and give them the technologies they're looking for as long as we work together with them. Well, speaking of technology, so you stood up an R and D center, a dedicated R and D center uh, earlier this year, and one of the things you talked about in that announcement was your strategy on, on EVs, electric vehicles, certainly been the talk of the passenger car business uh, and in a lot of different industries. What's, what's happened in specialty vehicles and how are you guys going to stay out front? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a very interesting question. I think, you know, and I, I'm going to go back to it's a theme, right? And hopefully the, the people listening to this won't get as sick as my team is hearing me talk about how we have to remain agile, nimble, flexible. You know, our, our EV strategy like the company strategy has developed over time. And the team has been, um, I should come up with an acronym for those, by the way. Uh, the team has been um, really, you know, taking those the agile, nimble, flexible to heart. And, and the reason I say that is at the beginning of our strategy, we want to stay agnostic, uh, if you will, similar to what we, we have with the ICE chassis, where we can buy from a number of, of OEMs that are producing them. Um, and then as we, as we thought that and we, and we looked at it, um, and then over the last few years, 
along with you know looking at the industry, we looked at a lot of companies and and try to figure out if anyone was going to come up with um, a, a real chassis. And what we saw a lot of from the startups were a lot of skateboards. When I say a skateboard, it, maybe you, you have the two the wheels in the front and back, and then it sort of dips in the middle like a passenger car would. That's not a delivery vehicle chassis. <clears throat> so we couldn't find one um, and that met our needs. And if it doesn't meet our needs, it certainly won't meet our customers' needs. So uh, late in 2020, uh, we had two of our largest companies, or sorry, our largest customers come to us and, and flat out asked us to get involved because, you know, you see all the orders in the public where our customers are trying um, some of the vehicles that maybe are out there uh, or there's a commitment, <clears throat> but it's a trial period and they're not seeing uh, the chassis or the skateboards fulfill their expectations. So, um, you know, fast forward to June of, of this year from late last year. And as you mentioned, we announced uh, that we're going to take our 46 years of building custom chassis for the specialty vehicle industry. Uh, and we're going to design, develop and build um, our own uh, next generation EV chassis. Um, and you mentioned the, the new innovation center we have, R&D center. Um, you know, the chassis is actually in that facility today. I received some pictures from my team of the progress and they're making great progress. Um, we're on schedule. Um, some may say a little bit ahead, but you know, we're, there's going to be bumps in the road as, as I tell the team. So let's just stay on schedule um, to have our proof of concept ready uh, by Q1 of, of 22. Uh, we'll have prototype builds in Q3 and 4 of 22. And then our plan is to have uh, production start in uh, Q2 of 2023. Um, and, and again, we're taking that 46 years of, of, of specialty chassis knowledge. We're going to put it into this, this chassis. Then we're going to take our, our body experience, which is, you know, 48 years, almost 50 years uh, of building bodies for the specialty vehicle business. And we're going to put it with this EV chassis. And, and I'll tell you, we got some great partners, um, partners from the auto industry, partners from, from electronics industry that, that are working with us um, to develop not only the, the, the batteries and the e-axles and the power distribution, um, but also the software. And that's what is going to be pretty neat is we weren't, the shift group is not going to buy someone's software. That's our, as, as we say, that's our IP, that's our intellectual property. And, and we're paying for that design from a, a software company. Uh, we've ridden in vehicles that they've worked on in the past. We like it. We have tweaked some things just for our, our uh, duty cycle, but uh, it's going to be our own EV chassis. It's not going to be uh, anybody else's software. So we're excited about it. And, uh, and I think our investors should be too, as, as we have, again, all that knowledge that the startups are trying to, to figure out and understand the market, but that's something we've been doing. I mean, we've been shipping delivery vehicles to the USPS, as you mentioned earlier, for those 48 plus years uh, from our Utilimaster group. Yeah, that's exciting. I think, you know, maybe no surprise to, to the, the listeners, but, you know, based in Detroit, that long heritage of automotive, but the evolution with technology and again, it's got to run, it's got to deliver, it's got to do all the all the work that uh, that these vehicles have been known for and who better to do it than a company that's been doing it for five decades. Uh, and, and, you know, certainly, you I mean, your background, you were uh, a uh, industrial and manufacturing major, uh, Lawrence Tech, and then you went to the great University of Michigan State for that MBA, a uh, big win this fall, uh, looking great. I think uh, uh, Walker for Heisman, for sure. Uh, but, you know, talk to me about your background in the automotive industry, Lear and Midway Products uh, arriving at, at, at Shift with that, uh, that heritage, but still that eye to the future. You know, I'm glad you didn't say the year I graduated from Lawrence Tech, by the way. <clears throat> um, <laughs> after spending, you know, 30 years in the auto industry, um, it, it was very comfortable and, and I, I knew my way around. And... Um, it is the opportunity at the shift group, you know, was was like a lot of us get every day. You get a phone call um, from a recruiter and, and the way they presented it was, um, you know, was very interesting. Um, and honestly, uh, a, a lot of um, people in the industry that I know when I made the decision to move, uh, they 
they were stunned. They're like, why are you doing that? Um, Cause I did take a, you know, a title change uh, from a CEO job at Midway Products um, to join the shift group and um, a, a bit of a pay reduction. But what I did see in, in this is, you know, I think what most people need to, you know, if they have the opportunity um, and you can see it and you take your skills that you've honed over those 30 years at the Lear Corporation and then again at Midway Products, like you mentioned, and, and you walk into a facility and, and you look at, you know, the facility, how it's run, um, the products, and, and then the opportunities to improve it. And that's where I, I just saw a lot of opportunities of improvement. Um, you know, the company was struggling financially. Um, I don't think it's a surprise that it was a turnaround at the time. Um, but, you know, I did basically the same thing at, uh, at Midway Products. Um, then at Lear, it was just the opposite. We grew so fast. <clears throat> so um, I think it was a billion dollars a year for 17 years when I was there is what we grew. So we're not quite on that pace here at the shift group. But, um, you know, as you mentioned, the, the Fortune's 100 fastest growing companies. Uh, we do have a, a pretty good growth um, as a, a percentage basis, um, and that's just based on all the opportunities that that were on the shop floor. Now, look, I can't I can't do those like any good leader, right? You call me the quarterback. You have an, an exceptional team, and the team we have in place has done a great job. Uh, we have changed out the team, um, moving our headquarters from Charlotte here to, to, to Southeast Michigan. Um, just the, the level of talent is exceptional. And uh, the two guys we have leading the divisions are, are fantastic. Um, you know, one's been here four years, one's been six. So they understand the market, they understand the customers, and uh, they help tremendously with, with the, you know, the skills and the ideas I brought and they, they put it into motion. It was, it's been fun. Well, I certainly, uh, you know, I, I watched as you as you came in and kind of put your money where your mouth is, came in as COO, moved quickly to CEO. Uh, the stock price uh, for, for our listeners, uh, when you joined the company on July 31 of 14, was $4.32. Yeah. So a 52-week high uh, this year, uh, that, that's, a 10, uh, that's a 10 bagger, 10 times in, in seven years. So awesome, uh, awesome track record and history. And it sounds like you've got a whole lot more ahead of you as well, which is exciting. And, and, and so, so talk to me about, you know, you, 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 uh, you added a stock perk. So to, to those investors, the retail investors out there, B2B company, but you, 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 say, you may seem like an old line business, but you actually serve really contemporary industries and some of the fastest growing industries uh, for big brands like FedEx and UPS and Amazon and USPS and others. So you've got a, you've got a stock for why, why do you Why are retail investors important to you? You know, I think that's it's an overlooked uh, segment, if, if you will. Uh, when we look at our investor base, which we, we're looking at it, you know, every quarter something happens in the stock price. We're trying to understand what's going on. And our, our investor base is 86% institutional holders. Um, and, you know, by, by joining Ticker and, and being part of that and, and having perks, we thought that that would help us expand um, the, the retail investor. Um, you know, not all people can invest through, you know, institution type funds. So, you know, we, we do have an ESPP, employee stock purchase plan, where our employees are buying them, buying shares. Could be friends, right? Families, vendors, customers. There's a, we feel there's a whole, you know, much larger segment than just the institutional. And if we can get the message out, um, like, like you're helping today, uh, you know, and people, I think, you know, at least my personal investments, um, you, know, you hold longer. You're not trying just to hit a number. You, you like to see constant, you know, increase in your stock price, which the shift, as you mentioned, uh, 10 times uh, over the last seven years. Um, it's a pretty good record. And, and I think we continue to perform like we have, which, which we plan to do over the next, you know, you know, short term, three years, longer term, five. We see great trends in, in both of the segments. Um, and we just wanted to recognize the, the uh, retail investor with, with um, having the opportunity for them to get a little perk. Um, and hopefully we can change those up periodically so they don't continue to get the same item. But um, it's something we think we, we thought we needed to do. And, and so far, we're excited about it. 
Yeah, I mean, Shift has been uh, has, has spent some time with uh, focusing on retail over the years, but really because of online investing, it's gotten so difficult to to find them. So I I think it's really it's really smart and a smart strategy. And so speaking of uh, investing, Daryl the investor, uh, obviously Shift is uh, is is your best stock in your portfolio, and you got plenty of that. And and uh, what else is uh, the, the capital one? What's in your wallet? What's in your what's in your portfolio? What's another uh, one that you really like? You know, when I when I do talk to to my my advisor, we, we do talk about and obviously last mile delivery and infrastructure for sure. Um, but you know the what I like is the especially the infrastructure companies. Um, I, I've been watching some of those. I like how they're performing. Um, and then, you know, that's sort of maybe on the on the growth side. But, uh, you know, I also like the blue chips. Um, look, there's nothing wrong with consistent performance year over year. You get nice dividends, right? Some of them have higher yield dividends. So um, that's that's where I get comfortable with those. Makes me sleep easy at night. But uh, uh, the other ones, last mile infrastructure, you know, when I say infrastructure, it's just not trucks or last mile is just not trucks. It's the companies that are in last mile. It's the, the newer companies to last mile. It's also the infrastructure. I mean, I think our country, right, at least here in Michigan, our roads do need to get fixed, um, the bridges. And, and I think that's, you know, that's something that's going to continue to drive our growth over a number of years because the infrastructure can't be fixed in a couple of years. So um, and we're going to continue to invest the company into, into infrastructure growth. Um, you know, you saw that through our acquisition. So we're we're pretty bullish on both of those, um, and I also like the blue chips myself. Well, maybe uh, maybe some uh, some Ferrari is in your future. You know, they're public, publicly traded, and uh, uh, a birdie told me that uh, that you uh, you will occasionally do a little uh, driving experience in in a, in a Ferrari and, and get some adrenaline going. Uh, you know, talk, maybe talk to me about uh, you know what uh, what it is about a, a fast car and that performance that maybe inspires some of what uh, what you're working on every day. Yeah. Well, first, I want to, under full disclosure, that it's not my Ferrari. Uh, <laughs> it was a uh, uh, if I if I think of the event you're talking about, it was a uh, um, Father's Day event that my lovely wife uh, uh, booked for me, and of course, um, you know majority of the kids wanted to participate as well. So we did as a family thing um, out at the M1 concourse <clears throat> racetrack out here in Pontiac. They had a performance car day where you could uh, rent some time. I think you got three or four laps in a, in a pretty fun car. And uh, uh, it's actually my first time on a track and a, in a first time in a car like that. So it was very exciting. Um, and it, uh, it, it, it does get you going, but I would recommend that you do it on a track, not on a, the regular streets like we see a lot of people doing, um, especially on our highways around here. But no, it was fun. And, and it just, you know, I, I think regardless of who you are, you, you, you like, especially if you're from Detroit area, you like, you know, fast cars, good looking cars um, and speed, but, you know, you have to respect it too. And one thing I do remember, they, they put you through a little bit of a, a classroom and there's the instructor beat it into your head, sort of like my agile, nimble, flexible, that kind of thing. He says, look, you can only do one thing at a time. You can steer, you can push the gas, and you can brake. You can't do any of them at the same time or you're going to spin out. Um, and <clears throat> you think about it, right? If you make a turn and you're not out of the turn yet and you hit the gas, you're going to spin. Um, and if you're braking and you steer, there's a chance you can spin out. So that, you know, to me, that is still... Uh, resonates um, to me when when I'm driving today, and and obviously the, the two boys that were there, I remind them of that as well when maybe I'm driving with them or something like a, a good day. Yeah, I think there's a leadership lesson there too, is, you know, about being focused on on one thing. You start getting you start getting yeah. too uh, too far afield or don't try to do too much at any any given time. Uh, so you know, talk to me about uh, talk to me about uh, Daryl the leader. So talk about leadership. You've got this. You you you've been uh, talking about these uh, these, these uh, flexible, agile, nimble, which by the way spells fan. So you yeah. create fans of uh, of Shift Group with that uh, that acronym. Uh, but you know, if you think about uh, that, what is what's your? How do you describe your leadership style? <clears throat> that's um, that's a very interesting question to me. Uh, you know, <clears throat> I think 
each role, right, um, as a leader, it, it needs to be adjusted um, based on the team. Your style has to be adjusted. Um, for example, it, it just go through my, my transformation here as a leader at the shift group, right? Back in 2014, 15, when I took over, it was a turnaround. And, and I think, you know, you, you need a different skill set <clears throat> as a leader when you're in a turnaround company. And then, you know, switch into, you know, 17, we did our analyst day and 18, we, we moved from turnaround to growth. Um, and again, you, you know, through that, some of your team um, will, will be able to adjust with you, some won't. Um, so you constantly have to, you know, review your team, <clears throat> make sure they're, they're um, doing everything that, that's going to benefit the company. Um, but, you know, when you do that transition from a turnaround to a, a growth company, or maybe it's a startup to a growth company, those are some fine adjustments you make to your leadership skill. But to me, the underlying leadership traits are, are pretty much the same, right? You have to take care of your people. You have to treat them with respect, dignity. Um, and, and I actually use a lot as uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? If you keep that in, in your mind and, and you look at those, um, and I typically have it, you know, on a, on a bulletin board in my office or, tape somewhere, um, just as a reminder that, you know, what do you need to do as a leader? Because you can get, you know, you can get your head full of, of a bunch of different things that really don't matter. And you have to boil it back down to what really matters with your team. How do you treat them? Um, so if, if you, if I get, you know, try to answer your question about what leadership style do I have? Uh, it depends on <clears throat> what book you read, right? There's three, four, five different styles. Um, and they all have names for them. I'm not that sophisticated. I, 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 honestly, I'm not. I, I like to set clear goals for the team, um, hold them accountable, work with them collaboratively, whether it's me and them or, or a small group, to achieve the goals. Because if they reach their goals, the company will reach theirs, right? And then along the way, um, I, I do some coaching and mentoring <clears throat> on different things that I've you know, hopefully or majority of our team is younger than me. So I, I have, you know, some, some more scars, if you will, from the auto industry, but take those lessons learned and, and try to share them with them so that they don't make the same mistake that I made or a team that I was on made or a small group made in the past. So that's how I really <clears throat> look at my leadership style. I am not a micromanager. Now, if you need to, I think, again, you have to be flexible and go back to do that when you're in a crisis zone or something. Um, so that's why I think you, if you can't say one style is going to work for every situation. And, and uh, that's where I, I think it's more flexible. Um, but you also have to understand your team because even your teammates can be different. I mean, you look at a, an NFL game or the, the Michigan State game over the weekend, right? Coach Tucker is treating some of the guys differently on a sideline than, than others. And that's just, it's situational. Um, but the traits of a good leader are basically all the same. And, and I think that's important for people to understand. Well, I think that flexibility and adaptation, I mean, you started as CEO uh, in a turnaround, uh, transition to growth, uh, added acquisitions, uh, which uh, seems to be a continuing part of the, the growth strategy. Uh, all along the way, you're giving back to your team by you know, the humility of saying, hey, I've been, I've been through this before. And, you know, don't make the same mistake that I did. And I think that takes, you know, that's real, I think, maturity as a leader to be able to say, listen, this is, this is something I've learned from, and here's how I, that can benefit you as a, as a leader. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. So, so maybe just uh, kind of wrap us up here. Uh, talk about what, what you're most excited about at, at Shift in the future. Uh, <clears throat> you know, when I, when I, I, I look at um, the Shift group and, and where we – we've been right and and where we're going um you know the for our investors that have been on the the ride from the start you know four dollars whatever it was to where we are today now that's been that's been great and and to me it's still in the early innings um we're we've adjusted right the company to be two segments um infrastructure and and uh last mile delivery and to me both of them are, are headed in the right direction, right? 
Um, last mile delivery has been super exciting. We talked about the effect of COVID. Brick and mortar stores closing. You know, they're not going to come back. I, I don't feel. I think people are comfortable ordering online. So we see that as a you know three to five year run still, with some some nice growth. And then if you you layer infrastructure, and this is you know we haven't talked about it too much today, but um, back in seventeen when we developed the strategy, it, it's a it's a five year strategy. Most people use three. We went with five. And every year we add a new fifth year onto it. So it's a rolling five year strategy. The first three are pretty clear. The, the, the last two are get a little fuzzy. But um, when you look at infrastructure, I think infrastructure is going to you know, start. Um, I, I do believe uh, we're going to get an infrastructure bill in, in D.C. Um, the country needs it. And I think that's you know, that can be bipartisan. There's a lot of other nonsense there that I don't want to talk about. But I do think the infrastructure bill is going to get passed at, at some level. Our country needs it, especially when you, you look at other countries around the world, how much they're spending. Um, so I think that's going to layer right on top of, of the last mile delivery and, and give us a number of, of great years going forward with growth. So I, uh, I'd like to do a little research before I, I do these and found out that you played a little rugby uh, in England when you were there early in your career. Yeah. And to pick up some uh, pick up some of the game, uh, it feels to me like that may that may be a good analogy for your leadership of that kind of toughness, competitiveness, uh, teamwork. Uh, but you you, th you think you still got it? Can you get out on that field? And, no, I'm I'm retired. I'm retired a long time ago. Oh. <laughs> See, that's, that good. You talked to somebody that's got some uh, some history that uh, not too many people know about. Yeah, we were. I was over in the UK working for Lear on a. Uh, a plant we took over from Jaguar and they had a, um, and again, that was probably uh, maybe late, maybe mid nineties. So it's a lot different than today. And my body was probably a lot, uh, a lot stronger and, and not as sore when I, you know, do a little exercise. So a little more flexible and agile perhaps. Yeah, no, exactly. Good, good, good point. Yeah, that's right. Well, I really appreciate uh, sharing the time with you today. It's good to uh, good to see you. Uh, appreciate all your background and congratulations on the continued success. Uh, again, this recent uh, the Fortune fastest growing companies. You know, seven years into your your tenure, you just keep on going. So awesome to see it. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate the time and, and uh, the opportunity to speak to you and and uh, potential shareholders out there. Um, and again, it's it's you know. People give me a lot of credit, but it's the credit for the whole team. The team has done a great job, and they continue to execute. So thank you. Awesome. Well, that's Daryl Adams, the uh, president and CEO of the Shift Group, and that's SHYF on the NASDAQ. Thanks, Daryl. Thank you. Bye-bye.